take the distress out of dining. Now introducing a revolutionary new way to enjoy your favorite meals alone. With the cutting edge technology of the TV dinner prepackaged meal, there's absolutely no need for you to go to the market, cook meals, or even sit at the dinner table. Indeed, everything you need for maximum nutrition and fortification can be found within the walls of this plastic tray. As electromagnetic radiation heats your meal, think about all of the human interactions that you were spared from, all of the time that you're saving. Speaking of time, it's dinner time. This is the future. This is the evolution of the human experience. This is what you've always wanted. All you've ever... These were all the promises of the nuclear age, right? <laughs> Vacuum cleaners and microwaves, all the ways it was gonna make life better. And yet here we are, we're 70, 80 years down the road from that era, uh, and, uh, and we're in a different spot. You know, every year here at Pathfinder Church, we actually poll our staff, we ask them a bunch of different questions. Uh, and one of the questions we ask every year is, what do they think is the most pressing human need or concern that the church needs to speak to? Uh, and this year when we asked, the answer was overwhelmingly loneliness. And, and that matches everything else I'm seeing. I so many articles in, in, the, in the newspapers about this, uh, you know, so much research being done on this. I went to the Global Leadership Summit this year and uh, there were, you know, these are all some of the greatest leaders around the world and so many of them were talking about loneliness and disconnection. This is definitely a, a thing that's, that's pressing on the hearts and minds of so many of us here today. And you might think that if loneliness is the problem, then the answer is, well, just make more friends. <laughs> That's, we don't need a whole series about this. Just get some more people in your life. And yet, I think we all know it, it's not that easy. Uh, in fact, for a, a lot of us, uh, even that idea of making more friends feels darn near impossible. Uh, and, and I think there's a reason for that. My opinion is that loneliness is not actually a core problem. I actually believe that loneliness is a symptom of a different core problem. And so you could try to make friends all you want, but if you don't fix the, the underlying core problem underneath, it's not actually gonna fix the loneliness. See, my belief is that loneliness is deep down a symptom of anxiety. And, and, and if you do the, the research and look around on that, that, that there's, there's no question that culturally, uh, that this generation, everyone living today, we are more anxious as a nation than we've been for as long as they've been measuring that question. And I do have good news for you on that. Uh, while loneliness you can't just solve instantly by making more friends, anxiety does have a very quick fix. Uh, it's actually a biblical fix. In fact, it's, it's one of the original 10 commandments. But we know very simply, very straightforwardly how to solve anxiety. So let's just start there. It's in Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. That's it. That's, that's how you solve the anxiety problem. If you don't know what the Sabbath day is, the, the Bible goes on to explain it a little bit. It says, well, six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day, that, that's a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And on that day, you shall not do any work, neither you nor your children, nor your servants, nor your animals, any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. And so therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. I am absolutely confident that this is the simple solution to our anxiety problems. I'm also absolutely confident that most of your eyes glazed over the moment you saw what it was. Much like my teenage daughter, the 10th time I tell her how to load the dishwasher properly, just glazed right on over. This isn't new. This isn't anything fancy or obscure. Everyone's heard about this. If you've gone to church any length of time, you've heard about Sabbath. Why is it that, that we immediately disconnect from this as a solution when we're talking about our loneliness and anxiety? Uh, and I think it boils down to, to something that G.K. Chesterton once said. He's a great journalist and theologian. He says, you know, the Christian ideals uh, in life, it's not that they've been tried and found wanting, it's that they've been found difficult and left untried. 
And I think he's exactly right, and I think he's certainly right when it comes to something like the Sabbath. That, that it's not like people have tried Sabbath and, and say, ah, it doesn't actually work, it doesn't do anything. I think it's that people start to try the Sabbath and it's extremely difficult. It's hard to carve out a whole day out of the week and not do the work and not do the things that you think your life needs you to do. It's hard, and so most of us have not actually tried it. But then when you hear it brought up again, certainly when a pastor brings it up, you say, oh, whatever, we've heard that a million times. You have, but I don't think, I don't think any of us, and this includes myself, have truly taken this teaching seriously. I think it's incredibly difficult to take seriously, in fact. And one of the ways I know that is, is for the last year I did an experiment. Uh, I started asking people a different question when I met them or when we were in a group. I didn't, I didn't ask them what they did for work or anything like that because that doesn't tap into their, into their heart. So I started asking people for the last year, what is it that you like to do with your free time? How do you like to spend your free time? And, and my hope was that I would actually get to hear people's passions and their interests and, and, and generate some spark of delight in them by asking about something that mattered to them. That is not what I found when I asked this question. What I found when I asked this question is I got one answer overwhelmingly, the number one most common answer to this question, and you all already know what it is, don't you? What free time? What free time? I wish, I wish I had free time. But once I get the kids to, to soccer practice, to music lessons, to scouts, once I get, you know, get all my, my extra stuff done, once we get dinner figured out, who has free time to do anything? And, and over and over again, in, in all different walks of life, this is what, what, I, what I hear when I ask people this question. It makes me think of this movie from a few years ago, a Click, where, where Adam Sandler is given a remote control for his life which seems awesome. I would really like one of those. But what's fascinating to me is that in the movie, he never uses the pause button. He, he uses the, the fast forward and the rewind buttons a lot. He, he skips through a lot of his life. But, but I, I wish I could have a remote just for the sake of pressing the pause button. And in fact, that's what I wanna talk about today is, is that there is something powerful in this idea of having a pause button for your life. But I think most of us would never even feel like we could take advantage of that. I, I don't know about you, I, I feel like I don't have time to press the pause button. That, that even if I tried, if I tried to push the pause button, all the other things in my life would keep going full speed. And just because I've decided to pause, it doesn't mean that the work that stops piling up, the kids' needs don't go away, that, that if I even dared to pause for even a moment, it would just make more work for me on the back end. And I think I'm not alone in that. I think for people that are, that are in the height of their careers, I, I think you're, you're struggling with that, that there's so many demands on you to, to be able to provide for your family, to, to, to do well at work. Um, I, I think about the circumstance that uh, John Acuff was in. I don't know if you know him, he's an author and, uh, and speaker, and, and he shared about the worst boss he ever had. Uh, it went like this. He, he said, I once had a boss who wouldn't let me use the bathroom during work hours. He had a timer on his desk that he used to track every minute of productivity during the day. If I needed to go, he would hit pause, making sure that the 90 seconds in the bathroom didn't count toward the hours I owed him. The official company policy was flex time, which is supposed to mean that you work the hours that best fit your life, but actually meant we flex all over your nights and weekends. It's hard being managed by a workaholic because you constantly feel lazy. He'd send emails at night, text messages on the weekend, and loved launching big projects at Christmas. He even kept a checklist to make sure you maximized your commute. There was an approved list of educational podcasts that he expected you to listen to if you had to drive anywhere. It was like the state-run media in North Korea, only stricter. And the worst part is, I couldn't quit because the bad boss in this story was me. I relate to that pressure. I don't know if you do too, this idea that, that if we're not maximizing every moment, every down minute, we're falling behind, we're failing, we're not getting ahead, we're not providing for our families. And I bet a lot of you resonate with that too. And, and you know, as hard as, as, as we working stiffs have it, I actually think there's, a, there's another group that, that has it even harder right now uh, in the season. Uh, I think there has not been a time in recent memory that it's been harder to be a mom. I think moms have it so rough right now. 
Uh, I read an article about a year ago, and I read it because of the title. The, the headline of the article was, The End of Mom Guilt. And I thought, we need that article. <laughs> we need to know, how, how do we get that? How do we find the end of mom guilt? Uh, and I, I felt like uh, Laura Bazelon, the author, summarized it pretty well. She says, look, the, the, the getting rid of the mom guilt is not going to happen. There's never going to be any change possible until working mothers stop trying to be all things to all people, perfect at work, perfect as spouses and partners, perfect as mothers. I think she's exactly right. This is an impossible standard. You can't be perfect in all of these areas. And, and she's got some ideas. She, she wrote a book that the thing that, that grieves me, the thing that makes me sad is what the answers boil down to, both anecdotally, she interviewed dozens uh, of moms for, for this and, and, and shared even details about her own life. The answer is inevitably in our society, they have to let one of those things go. And you're not gonna abandon the kids, which means the only way to make it work in her experience and in the lives of all the many women she interviewed was you either have to let the career go or you let the spouse go. So many of these women, they end up divorced, they end up uh, washing out of a career that they loved, they have to make a choice and the choice is you can't do it so you have to drop something. It doesn't seem right to me that there's gotta be a better way than just, well, you're gonna have to fail at one of the three. Or I think about how retirement itself has gotten really weird. I don't know if you're retired or if you know any retired people. Every retired person I talk to right now, they say that they are busier now than they ever were when they were working. That's scary to me. <laughs> I don't want that. Uh, and I hope it's because they're doing cruises and playing golf and, and, and just busy with all the fun things of life. But, but what I, I hear more than often than not is, is no, it's not. That, that there's this pace of life that, that, that just continues on that we're all in right now that makes it feel impossible to actually slow down, push any sort of pause button. And, and I think when I then read something like Exodus 20 that says we're supposed to rest more and supposed to take a Sabbath, I, I think I dismiss it and blow it off because surely God could not possibly have anticipated how hard and fast paced life would be in the 21st century. It's one thing to write that 4,000 years ago when, when they were just basically a hunter-gatherer society. Like, okay, fine, you guys can be slow-paced, but, but we, we, we've got a, a high-paced life here in the 21st century. God, you couldn't possibly anticipate the pressures and the burdens that are on us, the technology that exists today that requires so much of us. Except I don't actually think we have a technology problem or a culture problem or a pace of life uh, from the external problem. I, I actually think we have a human nature problem. Because remember, in the 50s when all this stuff was getting invented, what was the point of vacuum cleaners and dishwashers and microwaves and computers? That they were gonna free up all of our working time. All the time we used to have to spend on chores and on these laborious tasks at work. Now they can just be handled in moments because of technology. Technology was supposed to give us more Leisure time is supposed to be the thing that would allow us to rest. When, if you look at articles back then in the 50s, they were anticipating that the work week would be 10 hours a week in 50 years. I don't think the technology is the problem. I think there's something in our human nature, something that says that even when we get more time, we can't fill it with leisure and rest. We have to fill it with these, with these felt requirements and the expectations and burdens that other people put on us. The second observation I make is that I, I am a bit of, a, of, a, of an ancient times snob. I, I think that they had life easier than us in a lot of ways, but, but actually they probably didn't. They didn't have 24 hour grocery stores. They didn't have Uber Eats and delivery services. That They had to spend a far larger chunk of their day just providing the basic needs of life. Th things that I take for granted now. I, I think if anything, they were probably busier in Bible times than we were. Uh, and, and yet that they can talk about the need for Sabbath rest. In fact, I want, I want to look at a particular moment in Jesus's life, since, since we're, we want to learn how to do life from him, since Jesus is the one who clearly had this stuff figured out. Uh, and, and Jesus at the time, he, he was doing miracles, talking to crowds, incredibly busy guy. And it describes it in Mark chapter six. It says, Jesus went around, he was teaching from village to village. But then one day he did something kind of interesting. He, he called the 12 to him. Those are his 12 closest followers, people that have been, been with him for a while. 
And he began to send them out two by two and he gave them authority over impure spirits. He told them to do his ministry work. And, and so they went out and they preached that people should repent, you know, Jesus' message. And then they drove out many demons and they anointed many sick people with oil and they healed them. This is pretty amazing stuff. Uh, think about how important and busy Jesus and his apostles were at this time and, and, and how important the work was that they were doing. This, this was meaningful stuff. And, and after a few weeks, a few months, we're not, we're not sure exactly uh, how much later, uh, but, but a little bit later, then the apostles came back and they gathered around Jesus and they reported to him all that they had been doing and teaching. And then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat Jesus said to them, and I'm not gonna tell you what he said yet. I want you to just fill in the blanks for yourself. If you were in this circumstance, if you worked for, for Mercy or, or, or BJC or St. Luke's and, and there were so many sick people, you didn't have enough beds for them all, you didn't have enough staff uh, to keep up with the diseases and the people that needed healing, what, what, would, what would the hospital manager say? What would your boss say? What would you feel a burden to do, right? There's so many people needed healing that they didn't have time to eat. And the answer is we need to build more rooms. We need to get more beds. We need to hire more staff. We're all gonna have to do double shifts to make sure that this pressing need, that these people that need healing can be taken care of. That's what we would do, right? And so now look what Jesus actually said. Jesus said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and let's get some rest. Let's get some rest. And I don't want us to blow past this too quickly. It's one simple sentence in this story. And yet notice what volumes it speaks. I don't know about you. I think my life's pretty important. I certainly think my kids are important. My, my wife's important. Uh, the, the job that I've been asked to do, I think it's all really important. But is it more important than the work Jesus was doing? I mean, Jesus was casting out demons and miraculously healing people. And all of it was steps on a journey that was gonna lead him to a cross where he could conquer death and save the whole world from sin, death, and the devil. My stuff's pretty important. It's not as important as Jesus and the work he was doing. And yet if he can, in the midst of such important work, say, you know what, we're gonna take time to rest. How out of proportion what missing perspective do I have that I think my things and the things in life are, are, are so pivotal, so important that I can't possibly slow down and press the pause button. And I think it's because we don't understand rest. We, we, we hear this word, it's an easy word, and, and we think we know what God means by that, but I don't think we do. Because Jesus is not just an invitation that he gave to his disciples once upon a time a couple of thousand years ago. Yeah, they rested, but that doesn't mean anything for us today. This is actually a universal command and invitation from God. In fact, when you go back and look at those original 10 commandments, God circled back around to the Sabbath one and he gave us some extra context, some new information. God says, the Israelites, my people, that if you're, if you're gonna be a God follower, if you're, if you're gonna know me, trust me, if you're gonna follow me, then, then you are to observe this Sabbath commandment that I've given you, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant, by which he means no expiration date. There's not a time where this covenant's gonna, gonna go out, out of style or, 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 or be supplanted by something else. You, know, you can have a new covenant that replaces old things, but God's saying this is a lasting covenant forever. The people who follow me are going to follow the Sabbath. That, that's, this idea of resting is, is forever. And then he says even further, not only that, it will be a sign forever between me and my people. God's saying, how do you know that, that, there's, that there's a relationship between me and my people? How do you know? The Sabbath, that's gonna be the sign forever. Because in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day, he rested and he was refreshed. This is a big deal, guys. God's saying, you know how the world is gonna know that we're Christians and that Christians are different from the world? It's not that we don't murder. You'd think it would be not murdering. You'd think that would be a big thing for Christians to look different from the world. It's not that we don't lie or, or don't steal or anything. God's saying the way the world will know you are different, the way the world will know that you are my people is that you rest. Think what a big deal this is. This is starting to shift out of a, a nice suggestion or a thing that people used to be able to do, but we don't have time for that anymore. This is God saying, this is the identity marker. 
This is the thing that should make your life look different from everyone else's is that we are a people of rest. And if that sounds weird to you, it sounds weird to me too. It sounds weird to all of us. That there must be something that we're missing why this would be so important that, that God would say, this, this is a bigger deal than the murdering or the stealing or the lying it, it is the resting. That's huge. And, and, and I think we struggle with it because I don't think we understand the why. The why of the Sabbath. Why is this commandment so important out of all the other 10? Why is this the one that's gonna last forever? Uh, and, and we get a glimpse here. Let's, let's kind of refresh and, and see uh, you know, that, that, that God, why do we do this? Because this is rooted in God's creation story. That in Genesis, it talks about how in six days he made everything and on the seventh day he rested and he was refreshed. And, and I've always struggled with this passage because God's not a physical being like you and me. He, he doesn't need rest. He doesn't get tired. And, and so what's going on here? Like, well, why would God rest on the seventh day? It's not like he actually needed to take a nap. That's, that's not a thing God needs. I need naps all the time. God, not so much. And so I've always kind of blown this off. And I thought, you know, it's just God modeling for us how he wants us to be. You know, he didn't really need to rest himself, but, but he wanted us to know what it looked like. So he's just doing this fake resting so that we would take him seriously. I actually don't think that's the truth anymore. I, I don't think that's what's going on. I, I think that the Bible is trying to tell us something really important, that God was refreshed in a very real way and that that's what he wants us to follow. And, and so let's think about it in terms of another need that we have. Uh, th think about just this idea that, that why do we eat? We eat because we are hungry. There is a, there is a problem. The problem is that we have hunger and the, and the solution is that we eat. And when we eat, we become less hungry. And, and so in the same way then, if we know that's how that works, we'll, we'll then answer this question. So we rest then because we are blank. And for all of my life, I have filled in the sentence, we rest because we are tired. It just seems obvious. But as I, as I wrestle with the scriptures this week, I, I really do believe that that is not the correct way to fill in this blank. And it's not what I think God is communicating to us in scripture. I, I really have come to, to believe that we rest because we are busy. That busy is the problem and rest is the solution. But we don't think of it that way. And if we don't think of it that way, that then our lives get real wonky real fast. Think about how ridiculous it would be to hear somebody say to you, oh my gosh, I am so hungry that I could not possibly eat. You wouldn't say it. And if someone did, you'd, you'd, you'd shrug at them. It doesn't make any sense. And yet how often have you said, or have you heard someone say, I've certainly said it, oh my gosh, I'm so busy, I don't possibly have time to rest. We say it all the time. But, but I believe this busyness is the problem and rest is the solution because then it makes sense why God rested. Because you know what? God doesn't get tired. He's not a physical being. God is busy, very busy. Six days of creation, making everything, not just earth, the cosmos, every planet and black hole that we, and star that we haven't even discovered yet. God made all of it in six days, busy. And so he rested on the seventh day, not because he was tired, because he was busy. And rest is the solution to busyness. Jesus himself, when he was walking the earth as a human being, he was busy. He had all these healings to do, all these miracles to perform, people to teach, crowds to help understand this new way. Jesus was busy and Jesus then needed rest. And we need to reorient our, our, our frame on this, that, that the busier we are, for, for me at least, it's the, the busier I am, the less I rest. But that would be literally the same as the hungrier I am, the less I eat. I, I think we have to, to reverse cause and effect here. I think we have to decide and understand that rest is actually the thing that will make us less busy. I know that that doesn't seem right, but, but I think it is. And I think the reason we don't believe it is because we have settled for a version of rest that is not truly rest. And it's not what God is describing when he talks about Sabbath in the Bible. See, as I've observed my own life this week because of the nature of this topic, I've had to look at some of the things I do and that I call rest, but they're not. You see, rest, it's not just distracting ourselves from the stress of the week. 
Rest isn't dissociating, you know, those moments where, where, where you're so stressed out or you're so overwhelmed or where the present moment uh, is so painful for you to be in that you just kind of check out mentally and spiritually and you just go to a happy place. That, that, that might get you through the moment. It's not rest, it's dissociation. And, and rest, it's not just about the physical. It's not just meaning, oh, you should, you, know, you should get your eight to 10 hours of sleep. You should get sleep, but that's not rest either. And, and it's also not this afterthought. If you're like me, rest is the last thing I build into my day or my week. And what that means is it's the last thing I ever get because there's never any time left over for rest at the end. Once I get to that part of the bucket, the bucket's already full. And I've really had to wrestle with this list, um, and especially you know, as I've learned more about distraction and dissociation, because a lot of things I do, they, they seem fun, but they're not actually benefiting me. Uh, I'll give you one example. I, I'm, a, I'm a, a, an avowed card player. I really love playing cards, uh, like all different kinds of games, but my, my favorite card game is spades. Uh, and I love playing spades with friends, but it's hard. It's hard to find three people that, that'll sit down and play you know, an hour and a half, two hour game with you. But the good news is my phone has a spades app on it. So I don't have to, to try and get three other people to agree to play with me. I can just play spades on my phone any time I want. Uh, and, and, and part of my homework this week in writing this message, I went ahead and looked up on screen time on my phone how often I get to play spades. And I'm gonna tell you, don't look at screen time on your phone unless you really wanna know that answer. I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm so embarrassed at how many hours I've played spades on my phone that I'm not even going to tell you the number. Just know that it's, it's not good. And see, and here's the thing, playing spades with friends, I think is quality, good time. I think that is rest. Playing spades on my phone, it's all these things. It's distraction and dissociation. It's the thing I do when, I, when I'm bored in line at, at, the, at the checkout and I'm like, oh, let's pull out, you know, play, a hand, play around hand of spades. Right? Or, or, or when, when things are stressful, I get that email that just really triggers me and I'm like, oh, I don't wanna write back to this. I'm, I'm just gonna play some spades for a minute and soothe myself. I mean, it works kind of, but it's not rest. And, and I suspect if you kind of looked at your own things in life, the things that you think are restful or that you're using for, to accomplish the Sabbath thing, I, I suspect like me, you'll find a lot of them aren't. They're not actually doing the thing you want. Uh, and, and here's the question, and it's one that my wife, is, who's the one who taught me a lot of these terms, she really pushed this on me. And, and this is the question that, that's really helped me identify what's rest and what isn't. Is that rest the way God intends it is actually truly restorative. It's right there in the word. That rest is supposed to be the thing that restores. And I've started asking myself about some of my behaviors. Is this restoring me? Is this actually bringing me life and joy and energy, the things that I need to deal with all the stressful things in my life? And the more I looked at things, the more I realized a lot of them aren't. Like it seems fun or pleasant enough in the moment to just play some spades here. That wasn't restoring my life. Still isn't. And I would love for you to have permission to say that this is an okay thing to want for yourself. It's okay to want this, to be restored. In fact, God is the one who wants it for you. He wants you to be restored. And yet we settle for distraction. We settle for a nap. And again, naps are good. I like naps, but, but, don't, but recognize it for what it is. Is it truly restorative? And, and, and there are four biblical principles about Sabbath. If you really understand it, we, we, we only think it means six days of not working. It, it means so much more than that. And, and these are the four principles I'd like to give you to help you understand what's truly restorative. Because we actually know what it is and, and you can use this filter for your life. That, that re, what restores you is rest that is externally protected. And that's, that's an odd phrase, so let me explain it. Externally protected means it's not something you have to choose or fight for yourself. It's something that already exists structurally around you. It's a thing that, that the external pressures uh, already understand that, that rest and restoration is important. I don't know if any of you have ever had the chance to travel internationally, but, but I've been in lots of countries that still to this day shut everything down on Sunday. Have any of you ever experienced that? Where you, you go somewhere, you're in this foreign town and it's Sunday and just everything closes. And it's weird. You look around and you think, I just, need to, I just want to run out for a, for a banana or I just want to get some medicine or I want, want to get this thing. And you can't because it's all just closed. And, and we'll, we'll go to see a movie. Well, you can't. The theaters are closed on Sundays. And, and, and you're, you find yourself in this spot where you're like, I, 
I guess I'll just talk with the people I'm with. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't know what to do. It's this really powerful thing when you're in a society or in a culture that, that still has these kind of external protections uh, around that time. It, it gives you this, this chance to actually slow down and, and take advantage. And, and by the way, that's why God gave us the Ten Commandments. The commandments are not uh, some killjoy to, to ruin us from having, having fun. It's God saying, I want to protect the good life for you. I want you to have a better life than the world around you has. And the way to have a better life is to have rest. And so God's saying, guess what? I'm just gonna command it. I'm not even gonna make it optional. I'm just gonna tell you, you need rest. It's really good for you. And I'm just, I'm putting it in the 10 commandments. That's the motivation behind God putting this in scripture over and over again. It's why Jesus models it for us in his life. We need externally protected rest. And I wanna give you two like real concrete uh, working examples. There, there are two companies that have actually weighed into this whole rest concept. Uh, both of them you've heard of, it's Netflix and Chick-fil-A. Now, if you don't know, you know, Netflix is just that streaming company that you don't pay for because you know somebody's password. That's, that's what you know about them. But what you might not know is that Netflix prides itself on a revolutionary new HR policy. Netflix has unlimited vacation. Do you know that? Unlimited vacation. You don't accrue paid time off. You just have unlimited vacation. The policy is if you've gotten your work done, if you feel like everything's going smoothly, then take as much vacation time as you want. As much as you want. Go right ahead, take it. Doesn't that sound awesome? Do you know what happens in practice when that's your policy? Nobody takes vacation. That's real, they admit it. What happens is, I, I don't know about your lives, I never get to a Friday and think to myself, I've gotten everything done that I was supposed to get done this week. Do you? How many of you look ahead at the next week and say, you know what, I don't really have anything urgent. I could just take next week off, it's fine. We don't. And then not only that, because it wasn't mandated time, there was a fear amongst Netflix employees that if they did take time off and no one else was, they'd be judged. And in fact, if you do take a lot of time off that your managers might start looking at you and saying, boy, do we actually really need that paid position at all? I mean, heck, if they can take six months of vacation, we probably don't need this position. And so no one took vacation because it wasn't externally protected. Now what happens is, and if you ask them now, the Netflix will still say that they have an unlimited vacation policy, but they don't, that they made one key change and, and it's, it's revealing. They still say they have unlimited vacation for all their regular employees, but their leadership and executives are required to take a minimum of six weeks of vacation every year. And the idea is that then it'll trickle down. If, if, if your underlings see you taking at least six weeks, that will give them emotional permission to take more vacation themselves. But, but at that point I say, well then just be honest and give everybody six weeks of vacation. Why wait for that to trickle down? It's, it's because they're so beholden, they're so bought in on this awesome sounding policy. But, but the fact is, that's the real policy that they should have, is have a vacation minimum. You wanna have unlimited? Great, but give a minimum to everyone. You gotta take six weeks no matter what. Start there. And you know who does do that? That's Chick-fil-A. See, they, they do this revolutionary thing and I love it because they've separated it from a Christian sacred thing to do. It's not a thing you have to do because you're religious or because you're Christian. They've just said, we're gonna shut the whole thing down one day a week. And look at what a beautiful thing that does. I don't know if you guys have ever worked part-time or worked retail, I have. And I remember those days where you're always trying to pick up extra shifts or, or the car breaks down this month and, and you're just trying to work more to make ends meet. Uh, and there's always that temptation to try to work more to, to put, bring a little more income into the bank account. And, and what they've done is they've removed that temptation. You can't pick up an extra shift on Sunday at Chick-fil-A because they're not even open. Can't do it. And I, and I love it. And they don't mandate what you do with it. They don't say we're closed on Sundays so that you all go to church. They don't say that at all. They just say, take the time. If you're a Christian, yeah, go to church if, if that's, if that's you know, driving you. If you're not a Christian, go fishing. Spend some time with the dog. Just, they, they don't even care what you do with the day. They're saying, just take the day. It's externally protected. Now, I suspect the majority of you listening to me do not work for Chick-fil-A. So you don't have that. So this is where I wanna give you permission to, to lean on scripture as a thing that's intended for your good, that, that you might not have a boss or a company that externally protects your Sabbath, you have a God who does. 
And let me be his representative, his agent, that if you're trying to clear this with the spouse or with the boss or with some coworkers, I, I wanna give you permission to say, hey, my pastor told me I need to take more time off. Please use it, throw me under the bus. Let me be the, the, the bad guy, but do it. Find someone, some way to build this external protection in because we can't just keep clawing for it and fighting for it ourselves. We have too many other things we're trying to do. Find a way to, to, to let it be protected for you. F find an advocate, uh, an ally, a boss, invite them in and, and let them help protect that Sabbath time. Uh, a few more things quickly, we're, 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 in, we're running out of time. So a few more things. In, 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 true rest that's restorative is intentional and upfront. It's something you plan on. There's a really cool study. I, I don't have time to get into depth on it. They measured how people rated their weekends. And, and here's the thing that makes the difference. Even people who do nothing on their weekends, nothing special, they don't do, you know, go anything fancy or go to a cabin. The people who intentionally plan for their weekends, even if the thing they intentionally plan is exactly the same thing as what they would have done anyway, enjoy their weekends significantly more. They, they, they've, they've, got this, they've got the studies to show it, that, that just the act of planning for your weekend makes your weekend better, even if all you're planning to do is the same old stuff. And, and I've seen it in my own life. I, I always hope to watch a movie at some point on my weekends, but, but there's something different when I actually plan on the movie I'm going to watch this weekend. When I, when I actually anticipate it and I say, this is the one, I haven't seen this movie yet, I wanna see it, I'm gonna see it this weekend. You know, Sunday night, that's when I'm gonna make it happen. It's so much different, I look forward to it, I enjoy it. And what happens when I don't do that, you all know what happens when I don't do that, when I don't plan it. What happens is I scroll through Netflix, and none of those look good. Right, let's try Prime, I scroll through Prime, none of those. Disney Plus, ah, I've seen all these. It doesn't work. It's not the same level of enjoyment, even though there's so many choices, so much around us. Uh, and, and so whatever you can do to make it intentional and upfront. One other tip I've done just to share, by the way, is I've actually changed my calendar on my phone. There's a setting you can do that changes what's the first day of the week. I've made the first day of the week my day off instead of the last day. The first day is my day off. And, and that just helps. It's, it's, it's like just this little mental trick that just says, this is the first thing I'm looking at in my week. Not all the work I have to do. And then at the end, I hope to get some rest. I'm starting with the rest before any of the work I have to do. It's been super helpful to me. I commend it to you. A couple more things quickly. Rest that restores is satisfaction inducing. There are studies that, that show this. Sean Acor is an awesome guy. He talks about the happiness advantage, that the reason we're not happier is because every time we accomplish something, the goalposts get moved. So you, you, you do a great birthday party for your kids, well, and then immediately they, they move on, you gotta plan the next big event. You, you accomplish something big at work, well, what, what's the next goal? You, you have any sort of milestone and immediately we move on to the next one. And, and, and he says that the number one thing you can do for happiness is pause and reflect and look back on everything you accomplished today or this week and be satisfied. And again, that's biblical. Yeah, he's a, he's a guy that, that, that kind of made that idea up, but it comes in the Bible because what did God do at the end of every day? Every day that he created stuff, he spent day one making all these things and then he stopped and he reflected and he said, I did a good job. It's good. And then day two, he made more things and he stopped at the end of day two and said, yeah, it's good. I'm, I'm pretty good at this creator stuff. And day three, day four, six days, God gets to the end of six days and he looks at everything. He looks at us human beings and he says, it's very, very good. God rested so that he could take satisfaction in his creation. And we're invited to do the same. I promise you, you're doing amazing work, every one of you. You're doing good stuff. And, and it's important, it's valuable. God wants you to take time to actually pat yourself on the back at least once a week. And say, I did some good stuff this week. Maybe it's not everything I wanted to do, but what I did, it was good and I liked it. Uh, and then finally rest, it's not just physical, it's integrated. That, that we separate this out. We think that it just means don't do any work, you know, or just check out, take a nap, you know, sit on the couch. True rest, it, it, it incorporates all things. The Bible describes human beings as heart, mind, body, and soul. We're all of these things together. And, and when we separate them, we get disintegrated. Our lives are disintegrated. But God invites us, you and me, to, to do rest that's truly integrated. Uh, and I wanna give you permission to find that. I, I'm not much of a fisherman, it, it feels kind of boring to me, but the people I know that love fishing, 
when I ask them about it and then, and then brace myself for 10 minutes uh, of hearing about their latest expedition, this is what they're describing. They, they talk to me about how, how serene it is and to be standing in the middle of the stream and nature all around them and bird song. And, and, and maybe there, there's a, an intimate friend, a good buddy, a, a spouse, a kid or a grandkid, and there's someone with them. And, and they're describing Sabbath. That's what they're talking about. And I don't know what it's gonna be for you, but here's what I wanna give you permission to find. I want you to find these things, these things that bring you true restoration, these integrated things. And a good starting point you're already here is worship. This is why I think worship is so valuable. It's not a thing we do out of obedience to God. We come to worship because it's one of the few places that you can receive integrated restoration where it's physical rest, it's a break from work, but it's relational. You're connecting with brothers and sisters in faith. It's spiritual and mental because you're you're being challenged and you're learning. Worship is an integrated restorative experience. That's why God says it's a pretty good thing to do. But whatever it is for you, I, I want you to have permission to find it. Because if you don't find it, here's what I'll tell you now, the rest of this series will be a waste. We're gonna spend the next few weeks talking about relationships and and how to be less lonely and and the kinds of people you wanna build into your life, but none of it will matter if you can't figure out how to push the pause button on some stuff first. Because all that stuff, it's gonna be true, it's gonna be helpful. You won't have the margin, you won't have the time to do any of it. It'll just be one more burden on your plate. And so this is what I I would commend to you today, to, to take time to find that pause button somewhere in your life. And, and to help you with that, I gotta give you one, one quick tip and, and, and then we'll wrap up. Dion Garrett shared this uh, with me a couple of weeks ago. I, I found it so helpful. He said, you know, if you think about it, all the things we have to do in our lives, they really fall into three broad buckets. There's the things that you have to do, there's the things that you want to do, and then there's the things that you just feel like you should do. And, and what he observed and shared with me, and I agree, is we don't get that anxious or bent out of shape about the things we have to do. You just have to do it. You have to pay the mortgage. You have to go to work. You just have to do it. We don't lose a ton of sleep about that. And the things that we want to do, those bring us joy. That's not really a problem either. The problem comes with all the things in life that we feel like we should do. Things that we should do to get ahead, to be a better mom, to take full advantage of our retirement, to to, to make that extra effort. It's all those extra things that, that we feel this burden. I should do this. Uh, and, and, and Facebook, social media, they're the worst because you see what everyone else is doing and you immediately, that puts you in, uh, I should do that too. But, but what Dion observed and, and what I would share with you now is, is, is these, this and this, we, we, those are just there. This is where anxiety lives. And, and this is the area that I would encourage you, if, if you're truly feeling like you can't push the pause button on anything, I would suggest, I bet you can push pause on your shoulds. You still gotta go to work, gotta take care of the kids, gotta, gotta, gotta do all the things. And, and I hope that you'll find more of the things that you want to do, but, but have permission from me to push pause on all of those things that the world in comparison puts on you that you feel like you should do to get ahead or to fall less behind. And I know that's gonna be scary. I know that's gonna be anxiety inducing to even think about taking those things off your plate. And so I wanna close with with this promise from Jesus because Jesus says something to you as you try and face that decision. Jesus tells you right here and right now, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for for showing us this new way of life, this better way to be. Thank you for giving us in your commandments and modeling for us in your own busyness that rest Rest is the key and the solution to so many of our problems, our burdens and our anxieties. But Lord, I also know that we we can't do it without you. The uncertainty and the fear, it it looms too large. And so Lord, I, I pray that you would be true to your promise that each and every person here today would receive this invitation from you, would truly take these burdens off of our shoulders and would lay them before your feet and would receive your light, peaceful heart in its place. 
I pray all of this in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us and being a part of our online Pathfinder community. If you're new, you can find helpful links to resources in the description below or at pathfinderstl.org. While you're there, you can also find our message podcasts, which allow you to listen to the weekend message on the go. If this service was a blessing to you, spread the news and bless others. Hit that subscribe button, like, and comment. Do your part in spreading the life-changing, whole life message of Jesus by sharing this video with others. If you'd like to support our ministry with a gift, visit pathfinderstl.org giving. It's your generosity that fuels our work here at Pathfinder Church. Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you next week. God bless.